to the word of God. We want to come out of this morning from the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And I'm just going to read two verses into your hearing for the purpose of the word of God on this morning. We're going to read verses 1 and verse 5. 1 Chronicles chapter 29 verse 1 and then verse 5. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1 and verse 5. When you have it, somebody say amen. 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 And if you don't mind, please rest to your feet as we read from the word of the Lord on this morning. And the word of God says, furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Verse 5, the gold for things of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hand of of artificers, and who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Uh, the, the, the gold for things of gold and the silver for things of silver and for all manners of work to be made by the hands of artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord. Solomon, David says that Solomon has been chosen to build the palace for the Lord and David begins to give towards what is needed to build the palace. And then he comes down and he says, I've given there's gold for things of gold and silver for things of silver and all the things that need to be in the hands of those who are builders. And he says, and who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? The question isn't, is there work to be done? The question is, Who's willing to do the work? So God has sent me to ask you a question on this morning. Who then? Who then? The message is going to be entitled, Who then? Father, we thank you, we bless you, we praise you, we give you glory, we give you honor. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for the word that you are about to speak into the ears of your people. God, we give you the glory and the praise. Thank you for your power being present amongst us. Subdue everything that is not like you. Free us so that we can hear the word from the Lord. And we give you all the praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Let somebody in the house say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord as we ask the question, who then? I want you to 
listen to me very carefully on this morning. We may not shout, we may not holler, we may not scream, you may not run around the church, but God has something that he wants to say. King David had in his heart a desire to build God a house. One day while he was sitting in his temple, the beauty and the majesty of everything that surrounded him because he was the king of all of Israel. And as the king of Israel, they had endowed him with the finest of things to ensure that he knew he was deserving of honor and recognition. So while he was sitting in his house, he had a thought that came into his heart. He says, I dwell in such a beautiful place. But the presence of God or the ark of God is dwelling in a tent. It should not be so that man is held in higher esteem than God. So if I can be in house in something as beautiful as this temple or as this palace, my God deserves to be housed in something that is recognizing his glory. So David has a desire to build God a house, but God let David know that he would not be the one to build the house because the Lord said to David, you have been a man of war. And you have shed blood. Hear me. Desire alone is not enough when it pertains to the things of God. You, know, you already missed me. David, King David, had a desire to build God a house. King David is God's chosen vessel to be the king of Israel. He is a man after God's own heart. But once he had the desire to build God a house, God comes back and tells David, I will not allow you to build me a house because you have been a man of war and you have shed blood. So I've come to let the body of Christ know something that is extremely profound. That desire alone is not enough when it pertains to the things of God. Because what pertains to God must also meet the qualifications of God as it regards what will be done and who will be performing it. There are many who had great desires to build things for the Lord, but were not allowed to because of God disqualifying them based on his own counsel. I believe there have been many people in the body of Christ who have had desires. You really want to pay attention. Who had desires to do things for God that God came back and said to them, Although you have the desire, I will not allow you to do it. Because desire alone is not enough for God. Because when you want to do something for God, it must meet his qualifications. 
and not only as to what is going to be done, but also who is going to do it. God, what David wanted to do was to build a house for God and was, it would still be done, but it would not be done by him. Listen, the desire that he had was still going to be completed. It just was not going to be completed by him. Watch this. God rejected the man after his own heart. And if God could reject David, Know that God can reject anyone. Watch this. It is not a negative indictment against who David was. Because David still was God's chosen. Watch this. David still was the one whose lineage was going to birth our Lord and our Savior. David is still David, but in God's own standard, he had to reject his own chosen because of what he wanted to do. God says, you don't meet the qualifications of doing this particular work even though you meet the qualifications of doing other purposes. Part of the problem with the body of Christ is every time God tells us no, we take it as a blanket indictment against who we are. And God is telling me to tell you it is not a rejection of you as a person, but a rejection of you for the job that you are not qualified to do. But that does not stop you from fulfilling other purposes on your life. You just can't do this thing. David was not going to be allowed to do that thing, that thing which was to build God a house. The Lord also sent me to tell you something that is also equally important. That if God chooses to reject one, he always has another chosen. The work will be done. Although he may reject one, he has already chosen Another, it was not to be David, but he had already said it would be your son. It would be Solomon, who God chose. <clears throat> it would be Solomon who would build the temple to God. Verse 1 of chapter 29, let us know that it was God alone who chose Solomon. If it was God alone who rejected David, it was also God alone who chose Solomon. And the Lord sent me to tell this generation that God alone has chosen this generation to build him a house or to perform a prophetic work. Now, here's the thing that you ought to be excited about is that your being chosen was not man's decision. Because if a man chose you, then a man can also reject you. But what you need to understand as this generation is that God has chosen this generation to do something 
in this prophetic season that only we can do. And we ought to give God some glory that he has chosen us. And who God has chosen can't no man reject. So hear me carefully, this chosen generation. Quit trying to please man. Quit, quit trying to get man's approval. Because if man wasn't the one who chose you, what they think about you don't matter. The only thing that matters is that God has chosen you, and he chose you all by himself. Now, I don't know who I've come to preach to or talk to this morning. Here's another thing that you ought to give God some glory for, and that is, although he has chosen you, you were not perfect. If you know anything about Solomon, he was not perfect, but he was chosen. And the devil has whispered into somebody's ear, you don't deserve to be chosen. Well, here's a good thing. It ain't up to the devil. And if God has chosen me, I don't care what the devil has to say. Because God himself has chosen this generation to build him a house. And hear me carefully. It is not a negative indictment against the previous generation. But it is God who has said to the previous generation for whatever he had predetermined that they did not meet the qualifications of what was to be done. But they still have purpose to do. But their purpose is not our purpose. They may have had the desire, but we're going to do the work. Because God has chosen this generation. And watch this. And what he has chosen us to do is considered a great work. I told you a few weeks ago that greater work. Tell, can y'all help me real quick? Tell somebody sitting next to you or somewhere around you that you are about to do great things. Y'all, I could jump out of the chair, out, out of this pupil, but I can't. But somebody, somebody catch me really quick, because I need for you to understand this. God has chosen you to do great things. Greatness lies in your hands. You were not chosen by God to do something ordinary. Verse 1 says, for the work is great. You, are, you have been chosen to do something great. And let me help you to understand what that is. And that is to serve him. But I want you to also watch this. The Bible says, or, so, or David says about Solomon, he is young and tender. Now, some of you all may look at me and say, well, Pastor, that doesn't describe me. Go ahead on, Pastor. I might be tender, but I'm not young. Oh, I may be young, but I'm not tender. <laughs> but this is what God is trying to say to this generation, and you, and you want to hear me carefully. What he is saying to this generation is that you are inexperienced. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, people of God, what he is saying about you is that you are about to do something that you've never done before. You have no basis of knowledge. And the way that you normally gain experience is through participation, which brings about knowledge. In other words, what God is saying to this generation is that you are about to do something that you've never participated in, you've never done before. In fact, God is trying to get me to get you to understand this. In all of the things that you have experienced with God, and all of the things that you have done with God, he's about to do a new thing with you that you have never done before. If you think God has used you before, God has sent me to tell you what you are about to embark on is something that you have never experienced before. In fact, you are inexperienced in your own destiny. What God is about to do in your life, you have never touched it. You have never even sampled it. It is nothing that you have a basis of knowledge. You're going to have to have in your mind that I'm about to do something that I've never done. But I hear the Lord telling me to tell you, but don't be afraid of what you are about to do. Because he has chosen you to do it. And if God has chosen you to do it, then you must have everything that God needs for you to have in order to get the work done. Somebody hear me in the Holy Ghost. You have been pre-qualified. God, I hear the Lord. The Lord has just sent me to tell you that people are going to walk up to you and say that you don't have the experience to do what you are about to do. And when they say that to you, you need to turn around and tell them, I know that. I don't dispute that. But the one thing that you don't realize is I've been chosen. And if God has chosen me, I will be all right, I can do what God has sent me to do. I got this with God. I, all things are possible to him that believes. Believe. Somebody tell your neighbor, just believe. He says, he says, Solomon is young. He's tender. He's inexperienced. He doesn't have a basis of knowledge. And, he's, and the Lord sent me to tell you, and what you must focus on above all else, above all else, is that the work you are about to do is not for man, but for the Lord God. You are about to do something for God. You're not going to build something for a man. You are about to do something for God himself. Man don't have anything to do with this. And you have to understand that what you are about to do is for the Lord. And that ought Keep you humble. You ought to be humble that God has chosen you to do something for him. You're going to build something for God. He was literally telling the congregation, Solomon isn't building a palace for a king of a man. He's building a palace for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What he is building is for God. What? He comes down 
And David, at this point, begins to say to the congregation, although what he's about to do, he's inexperienced in doing, although what he's about to do is for the Lord, he says in verse 2, but I have prepared gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver and wood for the things of wood. And I've set aside all of these fantastic stones for the palace. David says, I know that Solomon needs some resources to build the temple. <laughs> David prepares everything that Solomon needs to do the work. He did not want Solomon to have to focus on the work and also worry about the resources. Because it's hard to focus when you're worried. Y'all, who? I can focus a lot easier on what I need to do when I have everything I need already there. But it's hard to focus on what you need to do if you're worried about not having everything that you need or running out before you get done. David says, I want to make sure that he can focus on the work and don't have to worry about the resources. So God sent me to tell this generation that he doesn't want you worried about resources. Y'all didn't hear it. Because if you had to worry about resources, you can't focus on what you have to do. Because it's hard. It's hard to consecrate, concentrate when you have worry in your mind. And, and then when you're worried about resources, you have to beg people to give you what you need. And then when you have to beg people to give you what you need, then you owe people. And when you owe people, people want to have an influence or say in what you're doing. See, God has this thing already figured out. Because what you are about to do is for God. He doesn't want man having any influence in what it is that you're about to do. So God has sent me to tell somebody that whatever you are about to do for God, he has already prepared everything that you need in order to make sure you can get it done. Somebody give God a praise for his preparation. I'm going to say this so you can understand me. Whatever you need, God has already prepared it. So if you need money, it's already there. If you need gold, it's already there. If you need silver, it's already there. You've got to understand the scripture. The scripture says he set aside gold for the things of gold, silver for the things of silver, wood for the things of wood. In other words, what God is saying, every need in your life, he has given you exactly what you need for that need. And the good thing is, you will never have to be dependent upon people. Because God doesn't want people to have an influence in what you are about to do. Because when you don't owe people, you don't have to listen to people. I feel like preaching. Somebody tell your neighbor, I don't have to listen to you. This is a God thing. And since God is the one that I'm doing it for, and God is the one who is giving me everything I need, the only person I need to listen to is God. He, he has, he says, I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. I need for you to understand everything is ready. Yeah. 
God is not getting it ready. It is ready. Y'all, listen. The building is ready. The money is ready. The resources is ready. Y'all ain't hear me. The architect that you need is ready. The bank that you need is ready. Everything that you need, God says, is ready. And everything you need that you that's ready, you ain't going to have to owe nobody. For what they're going to give you. Because God is going to have them to give it to you out of the goodness of their heart. I'm almost done, y'all. Y'all don't know I'm almost done with this message. He, 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 lets, he lets Solomon know that everything is ready. But then David then asked a question that also must be answered today. Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? He says, everything is ready. Everything that you need, Solomon, to build this temple is ready. The only thing that's left to be determined is who, who then is going to consecrate their service unto the Lord this day. Who is going to help God fulfill this vision? Because you don't want, and God doesn't want, everybody help. Can y'all catch me real quick? David is speaking to the congregation. And he's saying to the congregation, everything is ready. I've given him everything he needs. The artificers are the ones who are going to actually do the work. And now he says to the congregation, who then is willing to consecrate his services unto the Lord this day? He's speaking to everybody, but he knows everybody is not ready. He says, I need to know who within this body is ready to do what needs to be done. Because although things need to be done, everybody don't want to do it. So God has sent me to tell his people that the kingdom is ready. The question is, who is within the kingdom that's ready? In other words, people of God, think about it this way. The, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. The problem isn't that there isn't a need to work. The problem is a need for workers. So God has sent me to ask you a question, or the body of Christ a question, who then is ready to consecrate his services unto the Lord this day. In other words, people of God, you need to get ready to make a decision today. Whether or not you want to be included or if you don't. And here's the good thing. The, the decision is yours. Because when God talks about the decision, he's actually saying to you that whatever decision you make, you have to volunteer for it. You have to do it out of the goodness of your heart. In fact, he is merely saying to his people, you cannot do what I'm about to ask you to do because somebody is forcing you to do it. Because you know how we are in church. 
we draft people to do things that they really don't want to do. So y'all, you, you know, because when you get in charge of a committee and you have to do something, you get on the phone and you start calling people to help you, and you draft them. You don't even give them a choice. You just say, I need you to do this. And the person feels compelled to do it because you called them. But they're doing it because you called them, not because they want to. Or they're going to do it begrudgingly. They'll do it, but their heart ain't in it. God is looking at this generation and saying, I'm going to choose those who want to be used. Not because I'm forcing you or not because you're going to do it begrudgingly, but you're going to do it because, like David said, my affection is set on the house of the Lord. Watch this. When David begins to say, I have set aside gold for gold, and I've set aside all these things that Solomon needs, he says, and above all of that, I have personally put my own gold in, put my own silver in. Why, David, did you do that? Because I love God's house. I need to know if there's anybody in here who loves God and loves his house yeah. enough that you want to work and do what needs to be done, not because somebody's going to force you. And even while you're doing it, you ain't going to do it with a bad attitude. You're going to do it with a kind heart because your heart is to love God and you love his house. Y'all, I, 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 I need to ask you a question because God has sent me to ask you a question. The problem is we've got too many people working in God's house who don't want to do the work. And they got an attitude while they're doing it. God says, time out for that. That was then. That's not now. Anybody that's going to be used by God now, you're going to have to have the heart that, that loves God and loves his house. Is there anybody in here that loves God's house, that loves the church, and you don't mind working for the church because you know working for the church is working for God, and since you love God, you love the church? I wish I had a whole church full of people who love God and love the church. We could get a whole lot done if everybody just had a heart that was set on affection for God. Watch this. He says, who then, who then, who then, who then? David says, I'm going to do it because I have a heart for God. Watch this. And as I'm dealing with this particular text, the Spirit of the Lord shifts me. Because when you read the text, it talks about a willing Offering to give a willing offering. The text actually is talking about money and resources, giving money for what needs to be done. But the Lord sent me to say, and please hear me, everybody, please listen to me. God said, I'm not here to ask you for money. Now, I just got in trouble with the prosperity preacher. You know the one that everything they do is about money. And if they were preaching this message, I guarantee you, that right now they will be asking you to dig deep in your pockets to give God an offering to prove to God just how much you love him and how much you love the church. But God did not shift me to money. When he gave me the text, he said, I need my people to offer me something. 
but it's not money that I need from them. Can y'all help me real quick? Somebody tell your neighbor, God doesn't need your money. What he needs is you. In fact, when he shifted me, he took me to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God sent me to tell you that what he is asking for is you. This word consecrate actually means to fill your hands in the check. God says, fill your hands, but not with money. Fill your hands with you. Because you are more valuable than money. In fact, I hear the Lord said, I got the money. Did I not just tell you I have prepared everything that you need? I try to get you to understand the money is already there. What God needs is not the money. What God needs is some willing workers. Some people who are ready to sacrifice and totally dedicate themselves to Christ. And if you needed a reason, to give yourself to God in this work that's about to be done, can I tell you that the text actually tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech thee therefore, brethren, mm -hmm. he says, I beseech thee therefore, brethren, He's saying, I beg you, I plead with you, I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand what you need to do and why you need to do it is by the mercy of God. In other words, what he's saying is, Here's the reason why you ought to get ready to give your life, lay down your life as a living sacrifice to God. is because you have been a benefactor of his mercy. Okay. See, it, it always amazes me. And I don't have much time, but it always amazes me. That if I tell you to think about the goodness of Jesus, you start thinking about cars and houses and how he's paid your rent and the things that he has done for you. Or even when he has healed your body or what he has done for you in miraculous ways. But what you ought to think about. Above all of the blessings that God has ever given you. The greatest blessing that he has ever given you is his mercy. And see, let me explain this to you. See, the mercy of God is where you deserved to be punished or judged according to what you have done. But God decided to lessen your punishment. I need somebody in here that understands that based on your previous life, that if it had not been for the mercy of God, you should have been dead a long time ago. Cast out, ostracized, put away from God, but because of his mercy. Anybody know that you are a benefactor? Of God's, oh, y'all. I, I want to talk about his mercy. 
See, when I was out in the world, I needed his mercy. When I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing, I needed his mercy. Because if God would have judged me based on the things that I had done, I would have died and burst hell wide open. But somebody who once was on your way to hell ought to give God a praise for his mercy. Oh, oh, y'all, y'all, y'all act like y'all won't on y'all way to hell. I said, if you are on your way to hell, let me help you. If you were fornicating, you were on your way to hell. If you were a drug addict, you were on your way to hell. If you were getting drunk every weekend, you were on your way to hell. If you were committing adultery, you were on your way to hell. If you were a liar, you were on your way. Somebody ought to tell God. And because of his mercy, because of his mercy, I'm going to say this one more time. Because of his mercy, I have no problem dedicating the rest of my life to serving God. Is there anybody in here that don't mind dedicating the rest of your life to serving God because of His He says, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a, a living sacrifice. Watch this. Therefore, I must dedicate all of myself. Somebody say, all of myself. Not part of me, not some of me, not most of me. I need to dedicate. Watch this. And God is worthy of me dedicating all of me. Well, can y'all help me one more time? And this is what God says is your reasonable service. Or, let me help you, what makes good sense? Watch this, watch this. Somebody tell your neighbor, that just makes good sense. <laughs> Serving the Lord makes good sense. <laughs> Loving the Lord makes good sense. God using me as an intercessor, that makes good sense. Me dedicating my life to the Lord, that just makes good sense. Me waking up in the morning to pray for you, that just makes good sense. Me laying hands on you so that you can get healed, that just makes good sense. I have people all the time saying to me, Pastor, why do you do what you do? Because it just makes good sense for me to do what God needs for me to do after what God has done for me. It makes good sense to me for me to allow God to use me whenever he needs. Oh, y'all. That just makes That's good sense. And sometimes the body of Christ just needs some good sense. I tell people all the time, they say, Pastor, you do this and that. And I'm like, that's just my reasonable service. Me praying for you, that's my reasonable service. Me talking to you, that's my reasonable service. That just makes good sense. Let me close. And he says, and be not conformed to this world. Be not come, be not come, conform to this world. In other words, what the Bible is literally saying to you, don't let the world mold you into what the world expects you to be.
The world wants to shape you into the world's ideal of a Christian. And the world's ideal of a Christian is not God's ideal of a Christian. I'm coming somewhere. Because, see, the world's ideal of a Christian is that it doesn't make good sense for you to serve God with your time. In fact, the world wants to tell you, stop going to the church to do things every time somebody needs you. The world wants to tell you that you ain't got to pray for everybody. The world wants to tell you that you don't have to give people money when they need help. The world wants to tell you that you can serve God and have a good time in the world at the same time. But somebody ought to tell the world that doesn't make good sense. Because if I want to serve the world, then I will serve the world. But if I want to serve God... I want to serve God. So if I show up to church on a Wednesday night for Bible study, don't tell me that that doesn't make good sense. It don't make good sense to you because you are not the benefactor of the mercy of God that I have received. But if God had done for me or you what he had done for me, then you would be at church on Wednesday night too. You will be at church on Sunday morning, too. Yeah, you will be there every Sunday. Oh, you don't need to go to church every Sunday. That's because you don't know my God. And he hasn't done for you what he's done for me. Because I hate missing a service. I hate not being in his presence. I hate not listening to his word. I hate not worshiping him. Now, you can stay home because that makes sense to you. But that don't make sense to me. But for me, it's good sense to show up in God's house and give God all that I got. Every time that I come into his house, I come in with thanksgiving. I come in with praise. Somebody tell your neighbor, that's good sense. That's good sense. Now, that don't make sense to you, but it makes good sense to me. When people start arguing with you, why you go to church all the time? Tell them that's the world's sense. But good sense tells me that I need to be in the house of the Lord. Because I came running when I heard them say, let us go into the house of the Lord. Stop it. Stop it on the inside. When I get an opportunity to be in the presence of the Lord, I don't need to be in the house. I can be in my car. I can be on the street. I can be in food lion. Let God show up. And all of a sudden, I will lose my worldly sense, and I'll get a dose of some good sense and give God some glory. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name. Somebody touch your neighbor and say, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. That makes good sense. I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue to be in my mouth. That makes good sense. I need a t-shirt that says good sense. Because I want people to ask me. What are you talking about? So I can tell them when I serve the Lord. That makes good sense. When I praise the Lord. That makes good sense. When I worship the Lord. That makes good sense. When I lay hands 
Tag me! Good stand! When I intercede! Tag me! Good stand! When he wakes me up in the morning! Tag me! Somebody touch your neighbor in the Holy Ghost and say, that makes good sense. That makes good sense. Now I'm going to close right here. Because God really asked, sent me to ask you a question. Who then is ready? Who wants to be used by God in this season for what God is about to do? Because he doesn't want you to do it because you're forced to. He doesn't want you to do it begrudgingly. He wants you to do it because you have a heart that loves God and loves his church. So the question is, who then wants to consecrate their service unto the Lord this day? It's not everybody. I can tell you it's not everybody. Everybody's not going to answer God with a resounding yes. But I just come to ask you, are you ready to serve the Lord this day? And if you're ready to serve the Lord this day, somebody tell him yes. Because serving the Lord makes good sense. In Jesus' name, amen.